All right, podcasters, today I'm very lucky to have Larissa Wall on the show. Larissa has helped more than 2,000 animals find their forever homes, and she is a pet rescue expert. She's perhaps best known for expanding the Hallmark Channel's Adoption Ever After initiative. She's also hosted and produced numerous segments on the Hallmark Channel, including Home and Family, Kitten Bowl, Cat Bowl, American Rescue Dog Show, and Tales of Joy. And even right now, you can tune in and see her every morning on the Hallmark Channel. So her, her animal rescue efforts began at a young age and have paved the way for her career and life mission to use her voice to help the, help the voiceless. And Larissa is constantly fostering animals in need, volunteering at local animal shelters, and using her platform to advocate for animal welfare issues. She's super passionate about it, and I'm really excited to talk with her today. Um, you can also find her on the internet at larissawall.com. That's L-A-R-I-S-S-A wohl.com and on Instagram at Larissa Wall, L A R I S S A W O H L. Larissa, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. That was wonderful. And thank you for spelling my name because my last name definitely confuses people. <laughs> <laughs> so, why don't you take a second to fill in anything I might have missed in that intro and we'll get right into things? Um, well, that was pretty good. I will say that I started my my you know career as a journalist in news and things just ended up falling into the right place and i i thank my lucky stars every day because i get to do something that i'm so passionate about and we might not be filming new episodes right the second just because we're all staying safe indoors but our show is going to be back up very soon but you can still tune in and see me every morning and see some amazing animals that need homes. And yeah, I think you covered everything else. <laughs> Excellent. And what's the name of that show? Because I mentioned so many in the intro there. Yes. So Home and Family is our daily morning show. It airs on Hallmark Channel. The name of our umbrella life-saving initiative is Adoption Ever After. So Adoption Ever After is kind of just a just a, an umbrella term for everything that we do to save animals. So Home and Family is the actual show to tune into. Got it. Okay. Well, why don't you take us back to that, you know, first moment where you got passionate about rescues at a young age and just yeah, it. Let's, let, let, let things you. fly from there. Um, so most of it, I have to say, goes back to my mom, who is no longer around, but she was the original rescuer of the family. I mean, her and my dad would get into fights where I'd hear him say, it's me or the cat. And she would say, the cat, <laughs> because she always had a heart of gold for animals, especially the older animals, the special needs animals, um, the ones that she knew other people were going to overlook. And so it was a very average day for me to wake up on a Saturday and her say, okay, let's go. We're going to the shelter. We're going to go see who we can find. I mean, it was just, it was like an activity. I don't think most people, okay, excuse me, my dog's over here. I don't okay. think most people grew up like that. And so going to the shelter and being kind of on call for neighbors, if they found stray animals or friends of ours, if they found kittens that were abandoned, it was just all in a day's work. And so that has always been kind of part of my DNA, I think, because of her. And then when I started in news, I started as a reporter and I was moving to all these little towns all over the West Coast. And, you know, when you're a reporter, it's pretty lonely because as soon as you kind of set roots somewhere and make friends, your contract ends and you're moving to another market and you're doing it all over again. And so, you know, in each city that I was in, I started volunteering at the local rescues and shelters mm -hmm. because I really had nothing else going on and I always loved animals. And that's when I really realized how massive the problems are all over the place. I mean, I've always known that there's animal abuse, there's animal neglect, there's, you know, spaying and neutering, you know, that should happen that doesn't get done, all of that. But when you actually spend hours upon hours in these shelters and witness the people bringing their animals in that don't have any emotions, the workers that are so tired and exhausted and stretched so thin that they're, you know, kind of, their heart's no longer in it. Um, you really realize how much the system needs to change. And so I think that was one of the things that really 
was a turning point for me. And so as a reporter, I was always trying to make my local news directors do stories on animals. And they would laugh at me time and time again and be like, you know, people are dying. Nobody cares about the kittens that are being left, you know, on the side of the road. And finally, I would get through to them and we started doing more and more um, news programs, news segments on the local news shows that I was on. And, and it kind of created a following for me and people knew I was the go-to animal reporter. And so that's kind of how it all came to be. But things kind of took a detour because I actually ended up losing my job in San Diego. I was hosting a program that moved its operations to Phoenix. Hmm. And so I didn't really want to move to Phoenix at that point. And I moved back to LA figuring I would find something to do until my next news job. And my best friend worked over at Home and Family and she said, come along, we'll find you something. And I started there as a producer with no intention of being on camera. And as time and fate would have it, after a few years, they needed someone to fill in this uh, opening to help out animals that they wanted to kind of build that up as their network initiative. And I went to them and I said, let me help in any way possible. And that's kind of how it came to be. So it was a very odd turn of events. And I am so thankful for each and every one of them that landed me here. Wow, very nice. So yeah. it kind of started as, uh, as a little girl there and you, you, you grew up, um, it was, it was kind of, um, every week you had a chance to welcome a new family member into the house. <laughs> yes. yes, to the, uh, to, to the dismay of my father, <laughs> <laughs> who finally was kind of like, all right, there's nothing I can do. He's amazing. And he loves all the animals I bring in now. But, you know, growing up, there were a few moments where I was going, uh-oh, dad's not going to be happy. <laughs> But eventually he got outnumbered by, yes. by, by your mom and you and all the cats. The women of the house took over. <laughs> super, super cool. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, you know, as, as a journalist, you're hopping around kind of from region to region along, along up and down the West Coast, California, wherever it might have been. How, how much say would you have and influence would you have over kind of the stories that you covered? Was it kind of like, okay, 90% of this is you know, what, what you're going to be covering. And then you kind of had the ability to, to push and say, well, let's get this story in there. And if it kind of reached a certain bar, it made it in. How'd that all work? It's funny. Every station was different. Um, one of my first stations, you didn't really have a say. You all sat around a table in the morning. The bosses went through the big stories and they assigned you them and you gathered your belongings and you hit the road. And you better have something by four or five or six, you know, whenever that newscast was. But when I started at my second um, news market, I'll never forget one of the reporters walking in. I was just observing that day because it was my first day. And she walked in and she said, all right, I got this story. I'm following blah, 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 blah. And everyone went, okay. And I thought to myself, wait, you can, you can choose your stories? Like she didn't get assigned that. She just decided that was her story. So it depends where you are. It depends what else is going on. Obviously, if there's breaking news, you, you have to, you know, mm -hmm. stop, drop and hit the road to wherever that is. Um, and there's a little bit of both. There's slower times where you can go to your news director and say, hey, I've heard about this thing that's going on. You know, I really want to follow it up. Can I? And trust me, there were many times that I said, can't we do an undercover something or other? I've heard the shelter is doing something that's not on the up and up or the elephants at the carnival, you know, I want to go bust them or, you know, and they would say, no, 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 no. So, you know, there was always a little give and take, but you kind of, you choose your battles and, and you, you follow your passion as much as you can. And eventually they usually want, you know, let you have, have some of the stories you really want. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Um, so could you paint a picture for, you know, some of those stories, you know, maybe one of those, as you mentioned, you know, a shelter not doing the right kind of thing or just something that is common enough that regardless of where you went in a, in a, around the country, these sorts of things are happening. Can you kind of yeah. paint that picture for, for listeners? Yeah. Um, you know, there was, there's a couple that stand out to me. One was actually when I went to school at San Francisco State near you. Um, I was working in the journalism department. And so I wasn't actually 
working, working. I was, this was, I was graduating in, in, for my degree and they had us do kind of a mock story. And at the time I was uh, volunteering at the San Francisco Animal Care and Control. And my mock story, which I've now seen at, you know, every shelter are these amazing volunteers that dedicate their lives, especially to neonatal animals. The kittens and the puppies, especially kittens, because we have what's known as kitten season every year. Mm. These women and men that would come in, pick up kittens and be up every three hours with them, feeding them. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, when there's no mom around, these kittens need to be stimulated to go to the bathroom. I mean, this is hardcore stuff. And this group of ladies in San Francisco, however, it's not always women, you know, developed such a, such a camaraderie about them. Mm. And I always thought that that connection, that club of, of volunteers is such an interesting um, kind of underground part yeah. of life that people don't know about. And thank goodness every shelter or rescue I've been to has had that, that person or that group that go really above and beyond and take fostering to the extreme and do so much good work. And then the other thing on the flip side, the not so happy side, is um, when I was in Tucson, there was a wonderful group of people that would go out every week to a very well-known deserted dumping ground, animal dumping ground, mm. with people who either, you know, they would discard their animals dead and alive for whatever wow. reason that you and I can't fathom. And this group of people would leave food out and water. And if they were friendly, uh, you know, they would try to rehome them or find rescues. If they were very feral, they just tried to keep them, you know, safe and, and, and fed. Um, and I've grown to learn that no matter what city, no matter what state, there are those unfortunate areas that are usually kind of, um, you know, rural. oh, that very rural and, and, and people who go out and do this. So I think that unfortunately that exists everywhere. And again, I've always said working and rescue you meet and see the best and worst of humanity because people are, you know, are, you know, can be horrible to animals. And at the same time, you see these people that are doing everything in their power to be the voice for the voiceless. And it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Well, so, so you've got uh, three fosters that are, have made their way across the screen here for those watching on, on YouTube. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> you can tell they all have their moments with each other. <laughs> so uh, uh, Snickers is the one whose name I remember. So what's Snickers' story? So actually, the other three that are in my house are mine. They've been my foster fails. So they are mine now. Snickers is my only current foster. He came to me a few days ago. Um, he's my third foster during quarantine. Mm. Um, and he he's older. He's about 10. He was sitting in a shelter for a long time. His eyes are cloudy. We're not sure how much vision he has. He doesn't act like a 10-year-old, though. He, he's got plenty of energy. He loves going on walks. He's spry. But, you know two people walking around in a shelter, maybe he wouldn't catch their attention. He's just kind of a small brown dog with cloudy eyes, but he is awesome. He's with a rescue called Pacific Pups Rescue located down in here in Southern California. And he had a dental, so he has a few teeth left. They got rid of all the yucky teeth that he had and uh, he got neutered and he's doing great. He's obsessed with his toy squirrel. This is his best friend. <laughs> And uh, he's been sleeping and he burrows under the covers and he's been playing a little bit with my dogs until they decided they've had enough. And, and it's great. I mean, fostering to me is something so beneficial. And yes, there are those, those annoying moments where I've walked around and seen that he's marked something. And you know, you don't, you don't live for those moments, but fostering in general is, is so rewarding. And you kind of take the good with the bad. You realize these dogs or cats, you know, might not know what living in a house is like. So, you know, you have a little patience and you get through it all. So what would you say to someone who's, you know, let's say they're a family out there and they're considering, you know, getting a, a dog from a breeder versus going to uh, a rescue and, and, and picking one out? What would you say are kind of the, the you know, the pros and cons of those two, well, two paths? You know, look, I, I know people love their purebreds. I know people love their puppies. 
I understand and I, I, you know, I don't judge that. However, I would remind everybody out there that there are plenty of breed specific rescues and there are so many puppies that come into shelters and rescue organizations. Now, I would also remind everybody that puppies are a lot of work. <laughs> I know a lot of people think they want a puppy. And then after day two, they're like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? So I would really urge people to think about the fact that puppies are awesome, they're cute, you know, you want to show them to everyone and put them in your purse and run around with them. But dogs that are one, eight months, 10 months, once they're out of that puppy stage, can be so much better behaved and have such a harder time getting adopted because they no longer have that puppy face. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the edge of, eh, should I get a puppy? Should I not? Don't get a puppy because there's always going to be those people out there that only want puppies. Let them get the puppies. If you can open your heart and kind of extend your boundaries a little bit, get a dog that's eight months, nine months, 10 months. And of course, when it comes to, you know, going to a breeder versus a shelter or rescue, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to ever change everybody's mind. I know that. I've, I've slowly come to terms with that. Um, but what I can say is that I've had so many shelter and rescue dogs, pure of pure breeds of mixes, in and out of my house that I can promise you they are so amazing and they are so grateful. And the love that you get from them because I truly believe they know that they have been saved is unlike any other type of animal that you will get. And sorry, Snickers keeps pulling out the, right. <laughs> the computer. Snickers, well, get it under control. <laughs> and you know, you have to be open. You're. If you're adopting an animal or getting an animal for an animal, because you want to save them, you have to think of it that way, as opposed to getting an animal because you just want something cute to take photos of or a novelty item to have around your house or go on a run with. You know, that's, that's how I look at it. Because if you just want something cute to take a photo of, get a stuffed animal. Don't get a puppy that's, you know, been bred. And unfortunately, even if you find a breeder that you think is a good breeder, it's just the fact that they're adding to the overpopulation. We are drowning in animals at any given moment in any given city, county, state. We are drowning. And these animals have done nothing but be born. And at humans' hands, they're put down because there's just nowhere for them to go. So every time, in my personal opinion, you end up going to a breeder and spending thousands of dollars on an animal that's been bred into the world for profit, you're taking away a chance for an animal that's already in existence that desperately needs you. Mm -hmm. So again, I know that I won't change everybody's mind um, and I try to be understanding of that, but you know, it is hard because I just, I hope more people wanna be part of the solution and stop adding to the problem because every time we put money into a breeder's hands, be it you know a puppy mill, a backyard breeder, just somebody who had an accidental litter, it's just more incentive for them to keep going. Mm. And you know, most of the time, the animal's health isn't taken into consideration. It's it's money. Yeah, fair point. So let's say that a you know family or an individual says, you know, I want to I want to get a get a foster, get a rescue, and so they go to a shelter how what's the process for picking out you know okay this this is the dog I want you know should they kind of make a list of this is what I'm looking for before or just show up and let kind of serendipity and <laughs> the dog that they feel the most attraction to that that speaks to this, them this is the hardest part because I wish I could change the system because oftentimes people want to do good and they want to adopt. And it can be a complicated and confusing system. And they say, I'm done. I'm going to go buy a dog for $2,000. And at least I know which dog I'm getting. And at least I can walk out that day and go home with a puppy. And I get it. I get the frustration. And that's why I am so passionate about doing what I do, because I want to try to change things, or at least give people the understanding about why sometimes they encounter frustrating situations. So first and foremost, there's shelter organizations, there's rescue organizations. Shelters are run by the county and the government. They're usually 
animal care and control or you know los angeles city shelter they usually have care and control or shelter associated with the name they're what you think of kind of as a pound you know a big concrete building with lots of animals lining in kennels rescue organizations work as nonprofit organizations they're someone like you or me who decided we wanted to start our own nonprofit group and take in unwanted animals and find homes for them and anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you start your search, I would say, I, I tend to urge people to go to shelters first because shelters are, they have to legally take in pretty much any animal that walks through their door. So if you can imagine just the math of that, they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals and they have only so much room. So those animals are most at risk of being euthanized. Whereas rescues, because they work on donation money, they take in as they can accept animals. And so they don't put down like shelters have to. Because unless an animal, it's in their best interest to put them down for whatever reason, age or health, rescue organizations will really work hard to keep their animals alive no matter what. So, you know, shelters are the first place to look. I would say go in with a very open mind. Don't go in thinking you want only a certain type of looking dog. Really, really, really think about your lifestyle. How active are you? How, how um, present are you in your house? Or do you work all day every day? Do you, are you in an apartment where you have close neighbors that are gonna hear every scratch and bark and whine? Um, do you have your own home with a yard? Do you have a doggy door? Do you have other animals? Even if you don't have roommates or kids, do you have grandkids that come over once a week? You know, it's all those kind of factors that you wanna think about your lifestyle. Because the biggest problem I see is people go in, they see a really cool looking dog, a husky, a German shepherd, um, a little uh, cool min pin, and they're like, oh, that's, a, that's an awesome looking animal. I want that one. They get that animal home, they realize they know nothing about that breed, and that breed is a working dog. They need to be jumping, they need to be in agility lessons, they need to be herding cattle, they need to be doing stuff. And you work nine hours a day, you get home and you want to plop down and watch TV. That obviously isn't going to last long <laughs> because the two don't mix well. Right. That dog will probably start eating your couch, eating your blinds, digging tunnels in your backyard, and you're going to get frustrated. So always go based on your lifestyle. Look up breeds. You know, maybe go to the shelter a few times, see animals that catch your attention, and then go look them up. Find out about them before you just make a decision based on the cute factor. And then I would say, if you go to shelters and you don't see anything you like, and maybe visit a few different cities, you know, they're always getting new animals in, then you should start reaching out to rescue organizations. And rescue organizations also exist for breed specific animals. So there's golden retriever rescues, there's basset hound rescues, there's uh, shih tzu rescues, there's Maltese rescues. So all the people out there who love those kind of designer doodle oodle schnoodles, whatever it is, you can find them. It might take a little longer, but as I say, anything worth, you know, a lifetime commitment that you're going to have deserves to have some time put into it. Um, so, you know, Pet Finder, Adopt a Pet, those are all great websites where you can input your zip code and up will pop all different rescues in mm -hmm. your area that then you can peruse their websites, you can peruse their social media accounts, you can reach out to them directly, um, you can find out if they have adoption fairs, where to go, of course not right now, but once social distancing goes away. So that's, you know, those are kind of the basics of the two different entities. Um, shelters, for adoption are usually an easier process. You usually find a dog you want, fill out an application, and you're good to go. They may need to get spayed or neutered, and they may need to be seen by the vet on staff. Rescue organizations are a little bit more intense because they're much more choosier with what dogs they bring into their uh, organization. And a lot of them sometimes need $15,000 of medical care. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna make sure whoever this dog is going to is worth and is gonna take care of this animal like they have. So you know that's when there's gonna be phone calls home visits, um, application questionnaires that you may go, what, why are they asking me you know, for a vet reference and things like that? It's all to 
ensure that the animal is going to a safe place because these are their babies. So, you know, I, I just try to remind people not to take any of that personally. So I think people are like, what, my house isn't good enough? My right. backyard isn't nice enough? You know, whatever comes to mind when, when, you know, you think of a home check, it's not that at all. They don't care if your house is clean or dirty or what you make or, you know, but they want to know that if, God forbid, this animal falls and breaks its leg at 3 a.m., can you afford and are you willing to spend $5,000 on emergency vet visits, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's a bit of a different process. It can be a little lengthier going through a rescue, but they've spent more time with the animal and usually more money on each animal. And so, you know, you get, you get a little bit more info about the animal as opposed to a shelter. So they both have their pros and cons. Um, I urge everybody to look at both in their area and really you know you want to have a relationship with the human behind the animal too so you know find somebody at the shelter you can talk to even if it's a volunteer they usually know the most about the animals um, if you're going through a rescue organization make sure it's a rescue organization that you really believe in that seems to put them money where their mouth is you know um, does their homework, wants to make sure you're a good home. Even mm -hmm. though it might be frustrating in the moment, those are all good signs that they are legitimate rescues and that they will be there for you if you suddenly, three days later, go, oh my goodness, this dog, will, you know, it won't sleep. It's keeping me up all night. They'll be there to answer the phone and help you through it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember w when I was living in, in, in Miami, um, I connected with the Golden Retriever Rescue of South Florida. So very breed specific. And they were bringing in dogs from Puerto Rico and wow. a huge amount of their cost was like you said going towards the medical bills etc and so they not only had to raise money but then there was you know a waiting list for people wanting golden retrievers yeah. in Florida and so they they were able to be you know very regimented with finding out is is this home going to be a good home for this dog and so they would learn about the dog they would learn about the you know the, yes. the 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 family they would go and do a home visit and everything make sure there was you know enough room etc for the dog yes. to be around and, and um, I, I get that it can be frustrating I do you know we live in a culture where we decide what we want we want it now right. <laughs> I want a dog I want it today right I don't want to wait three months and get put on a waiting list and have them come see my house and blah 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 yeah it's like uber for dogs yes but you know if you if you take a breath <laughs> and think about the fact that you know this is a commitment you're going to have for a long time and these people are doing all this work to ensure that these animals are you know healthy and happy you owe it to them as well to let them do their due diligence and and vice versa and i get it it can be frustrating but that's why i just hope that people understand and have a little bit more compassion about why the process is how it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, so maybe there's uh, time for, for two more topics here. The first being you have so much experience, um, you know, fostering dogs. So getting into, you know, what's the best practice or the best way to get a dog acclimated. And then we'll talk about, hey, we're living in the time of coronavirus here. Yes. So what does that mean for everything? So maybe on the first point, um, Larissa, you're super experienced at being a foster a dog mom going way back to your childhood. So yes. how does one get a, you know, we talked about getting a foster dog or a, a rescue. How does one then get that dog acclimated into life for a, you know, a nice, long, happy, healthy re relationship? Yes. And it can be challenging and every animal is different. You know, I, I'm lucky because a few years ago when I had to redo my house and renovate it a little bit, I made very conscious decisions based on the fact that I have foster animals. So I put in tile floor because there's always going to be accidents. Um, you know, I, I didn't buy the most expensive furniture because you never know. So there are the, there's that avenue of fostering that you kind of have to know what you're getting into. There's always going to be little mistakes, little accidents, little things like that. Other than that, once you kind of realize that's what it is, you know, having an X pen is something that I think is very important, which are those big, large um, metal gates that kind of have eight or 10 different panels. So you can mm. move it in all different directions and cordon off areas or mm. make it a big circle. Um, those are always good because when you get a new foster animal in, you want to keep it where you know it is. So whether that means keeping a leash on it, even indoors while you're home, watching it, never leave a leash on if you're not 
you know, if the animal's not in eyesight. But if it's with you on a leash or if you're busy cleaning up, you put it in the X pen. That way, you know it's in one place. It can't get into too much trouble. The other thing is, you know, I always introduce the dogs, my own personal dogs, to a foster outside first. Okay. I usually walk the foster through the backyard and then let my girls come out and meet the animal. There's always, um, there's always a little barking or a little sniffing and maybe a little growl here and there. But for the most part, I only foster small dogs because my dogs are small. So I never want a dog that's going to overpower them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are important things. Again, my dogs and most dogs kind of get over it. Like, okay, they meet, there might be a couple little like, who are you? What are you doing? And then they're fine. So, you know, don't get too freaked out if, if there's a growl or two. They usually work, yeah. it, you know, itself out. Um, I also say this is where that relationship is so important. If you know the rescue that you're fostering through and you have, you know, somebody to call on if there is a problem, that is so important, just as peace of mind. Even if you never call, just knowing that is is very helpful. And then I also always say to people, if they're new at fostering, go through a rescue group versus a shelter because rescue group, you can have a little bit more one-on-one -on -one interaction with. And don't feel scared to give a rescue organization a time frame that you can do. Because a lot of people, I think, get overwhelmed at the thought of you're taking in an animal and it, you might have it for six months, a year. Like, there, you know, you never know. So if that is a concern, Always be up front, tell a rescue, I'm home for the next three weeks. Does that help you? I'm, I'm willing to foster if that's of help. They may say no, they may need some, you know, people that can only do long term, but they may say yes. And then at least you know, at least when you start out, that okay, we've got a three week relationship here, we're gonna make the best of it. And then maybe if it's going well and, and they haven't found another foster, we can continue it on, you know, whatever. At least it gives you a little bit of kind of a, <laughs> a, a breath of air. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, as a foster, it's your job to keep the animal safe and set it up to be the best pet for somebody. So working on basic commands, you know, figuring out a schedule, getting them used to a leash, you know, it depends what that animal has or hasn't ever experienced and every animal comes to you from a different scenario. Um, but that's the fun of it. That's what you get to do as a foster. And then when it comes time for them to get uh, a new home or forever home, you know, you're able to give some insight into the fact that, oh, Snickers has this weird thing. He hates tile floor. It's so funny. He'll walk on the carpet and then the tile's there and he freezes. You know, I'm just making that up. But right. you learn the little idiosyncrasies about these animals that nobody would ever know. And that then sets them up for the best home. So that's really the fun the challenge, sometimes the frustration, and most often the most rewarding part about fostering is you get to kind of be spearhead that, that animal's forever after, which is so wonderful. Nice, nice. So we're in the time of coronavirus here. I, I don't even know what question to ask. What, what should people know <laughs> or think, or what's well, your perspective on all this? I think the biggest thing that I want, you know, to try to remind everybody is that there's gonna be a lot of people turning in their animals because of corona, whether it's out of fear that they're gonna get it from their animal, whether it's because they've lost their job and they can no longer financially take care of their animal, whether it's they're sick themselves and have to go to the hospital and no one's there to take in their animal, there's gonna be a lot of reasons and there's gonna be many months of this. So my, that's the long way around saying, please know, that there is no evidence that we can get COVID-19 from our domestic pets. Now, there are some cases, and when I say some, I mean like three or four in the world in total, of humans giving or spreading particles of COVID-19 to their animals because they're around them all the time and they themselves have it and they're sneezing and coughing and living on their animal. Um, and, but even those cases, it does not seem that the animals can transmit it back to humans. Mm. From what, I'm not a veterinarian, but I've been talking to many and doing my own research and the World Health Organization and CDC has put out their guidelines. So that's the biggest thing I want people to realize. Don't 
give up your pet or put your pet into un unnecessary quarantine right now, it's not, it's not going to do anything. There's no reason to do that. Um, if you do want to foster or adopt right now, I am the first one to say, when you get your animal home, give it a good scrub down, give it a good bath, change out its collar and leash. If you want to throw its you know, existing collar and leash in the washing machine, which is what I've been doing when I've taken in a foster, go for it. Because those supplies, like even that little squirrel toy, I didn't realize how much Snickers loved it because I, I washed it twice before I let him have it. Those items are what can carry more in terms of germs than the dog themselves or cat. They don't believe that it can live on fur because it's um, porous. Mm. So that's the biggest thing. Please keep your animals safe right now. They are doing way more good than harm in this time of crisis. Please protect them and don't be fearful of them being able to give it to you. As of now, it has not been seen. And, you know, we're all keeping abreast on the ongoing evolution of this, but, but that's, that's where we are right now. And shelters are full. They're turning people away that find stray animals. It's, it's a bad situation and it's only going to get worse as more and more people can't pay for their animals as time goes on. So please, please, please keep your animals safe, keep them in your lives and reach out to others that may have animals and may need help or may, you know, maybe you can deliver some dog food to an elderly neighbor in your, you know, without seeing them, leave it on their porch, whatever it may be, you know, that may be the difference between that person dumping their animal or keeping their animal. So there's so much you can do. And the last thing I would say is a lot of rescues and shelters aren't seeing the donations they normally see, mm. which is a struggle enough. But a lot of people or companies that give monthly, you know, ongoing automatic donations aren't able to right now. So if you do have an extra $5, $3, $10, and you can donate directly to them, go on their websites, they usually have a, a donation link or Amazon uh, wish list where you can donate, you can buy a product they've, you know, listed as something that they need and it goes directly to them and you don't have to see them, touch them, cough near them, elbow, bump them, anything. Right. <laughs> It's contactless. <laughs> Got it. So those are my two biggest points. <laughs> and how will, you know, with the whole social distancing, if someone wanted to go and, and you know, take in a foster or, or rescue now, how would that work? Most shelters and rescues are still operating, though they're doing it by appointment or some of them are doing virtual adoption showcases mm. through Zoom or FaceTime. So you can still see and get an idea of the, the personality of the animal. Um, a lot of them are doing virtual home checks versus coming to your home and seeing it in person. So they are kind of working ways around it. Some aren't, some are saying, we'll take applications, we'll call you, we'll do virtual home checks, but we're not actually gonna give you the animal until uh, we have, you know, little looser guidelines in place. So it just depends where you live and where the rescues, or, you know, or shelters are that you're contacting and kind of what their protocols are. But most of them are still doing something because it's so important to get these animals into homes so that they can take in new ones. Hmm. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's a sinking ship right now. And so hopefully we can get, yeah. get it under control. Yeah, it seems like if it's already a problem now, it's, you know, only going to compound as, you know, wow. And yeah, and you know, it's so funny. I've had some people write to me that they want to foster and all the rescues have, they don't need fosters right now because so many amazing people have stepped up to the plate. Mm. But I keep reminding people that this isn't going to go away. We may be able to get back to work soon, um, hopefully, but this problem is going to have a rippling, lasting effect and yeah. more and more animals are still going to be turned in because of this disaster as time goes on so if you are willing to foster and you can't find a rescue or shelter that needs you right now see if they have a list for when they you know bring more animals in because they'll compile it trust me it is usually the hardest part is finding fosters so if you can sign up now and let them know that you're available you know as time goes on got it well, Larissa, this has been fantastic. Super fun connecting with you and hearing your passion Thank about you. rescues. Um, I, I think it's kind of the first one on this topic, maybe uh, another. And I think, you know, listeners definitely need to hear this and, and hear oh, from yeah. someone who's super passionate like that. So any final advice or thoughts for our listeners? 
Um, I would say just remember that these babies are voiceless and we have to be the voice for them, be it physically and mentally. Um, and we can be. These are all problems we can fix. There's a lot of problems in the world we can't fix. The, the overpopulation one, we can. We can get it under control if we all do what it takes, which isn't that much. So, you know, I would love people to get on board with rescuing, fostering, adopting, or just at least spreading the word that how important it is. And they can always reach me online. Um, I try to get through my, my emails and questions. It takes some time sometimes, but <laughs> please reach out and I will try my best to get back to everybody because I know it can be a complicated process. So I'm here to do anything I can to help. All right. Well, thanks so much, Larissa. This has been great. Everyone, be sure to check out Larissa uh, every morning on the Hallmark Channel and also her website, Larissa Wall, L-A-R-I-S-S-A-W-O-H-L.com. And her Instagram handle is the same. All right, Larissa, thanks so much. Thank you.